Hello, this is Scott again. So today we are going to talk about residual diagnostics. Um, this is R06. If you're looking for it on YouTube um, under simple forecasting methods, again, this is a series. Um, and then next time we'll talk about prediction intervals. So um, again, we're going to be using the library from Rob Hyman, and we've made several comments in previous uh, videos about Rob and what he's done, and you can reference those really great resource. All right, so when we talk about forecast error statistics, essentially we're talking about what what makes a good model. And so last time we saw that essentially the the forecast error, our individual residuals, our E sub i, um, is equal to the actual value of the series y sub i minus what our forecast or our prediction for that is and it could be that we're we're using a um the series itself this is normally the the notation or we might be using uh, other predictors to forecast but for right now we're just talking about forecasting a future um outcome based upon the individual series itself no uh, extraneous predictors at this point. So we want, at minimum, we want the these errors to be IID with mean zero. So what does that mean? That means that the residuals are uncorrelated um, and that they have mean zero. What we would like to have, if possible, and it's more useful, is if we have errors that are um, independently and identically distributed, IID, normal, that follow a normal distribution, Gaussian, with mean zero and constant variance. And by the way, so this is, this is, this is my um, uh, little mnemonic that I use for um, myself, uh, when I'm trying to remember a lot of the assumptions that are made, especially in statistical um, linear models and, and other other theory. So um, we're going to, when we have this, we can do a lot of additional things. Like, for example, next time when we're talking about prediction intervals, one of the assumptions there is we're going to uh, make this assumption that they are normal so that we can calculate bounds um, for our predictions, and that's going to be based upon a normal distribution. So again, this is this is nice little um, compact notation for four assumptions that the ver the errors are going to be um, identically distributed. They're going to be independent. They're going to have mean zero, and they're going to have constant variance. There is no i underneath this sigma, right? So that's constant variance. All right. Um, and then a lot of what we're going to be talking about uh, is the naive method, or we're going to talk, use that first. And then this naive method, um, this y hat essentially is the last observation, right? So that the error becomes the difference between the current observation minus the last observation. And we talked about that in, in a previous video. Okay? So... In summary, again, the, these first two conditions are pretty much required for a good forecasting method. If you don't have these, then you can definitely improve upon the method uh, very easily. Um, so you want this as a, as a basis. And then if at all possible, it, it's nice to have these other things because they allow for statistical inferences and other things. So let's jump into R. And I'm going to be using this uh, library again from Heinemann. And um, I'm going to create a variable. This is the Dow Jones data. So I'm going to create a variable DJ2 and just a window everything up to 250 um, to, to 250 data point in this set. Then I'm going to create a um, plot of that data. So now you can see this familiar plot. We've looked at this data previously. But now we've got a command for residuals. I'm going to evoke that 
invoke that command, and then I'm going to store the results in a variable called res, and then I'm going to use that res. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a plot, and so this is the, the plot of my residuals um, from the naive method, and again, they look like noise. They look um, uh, pretty, pretty random. There is a pretty big point here that's negative. Um, we've talked about the ACF, the autocorrelation function before. Let's get a look at what that looks like. And remember, refer back to a previous session if you need to, but we talked about these bounds and then essentially if nothing goes beyond these bounds, then we can pretty much um, determine that there's no periodicity or there's no, um, yeah, there's no repeating um, period here in, in the data series. And then the other thing that we can do is we can check for normality, a simple check um, to look at the uh, histogram of those, those residuals. And these residuals don't necessarily look that normal. Um, we, definitely, we have a left skewed uh, distribution here. You can see this tail um, skinning out to, to the left here. So probably not normal. And I can run other statistical tests for normality as well. So, I mean, some of those that you're familiar with, I'm sure, are, uh, you know, Komogorov-Smirnov. Komogorov um, uh, there's Anderson-Darling. There's Chi-Square. There are several um, that are available um, where you essentially can compute a p-value. We are going to compute some p-values now, but we're going to compute them compute them for the residuals themselves. So if I go back to this ACF, I can see that this, um, if I had a, a large number here, um, you know, just by sheer happenstance, some of these will probably cross this, these simple lines. So one of the things that I want to do is I want to come up with a more uh, powerful test, and we're going to look at two of those for um, computing a p-value, whether these uh, these things um, are uh, random. So the the first test that I'm going to do is the the box Pierce test, and so I have it here. Um, which, by the way, I've got in a note here. So it, there's two parameters. There's a lag parameter and fit DF parameter. So the lag parameter uh, typically um, we we often use 10, uh, uh, I should say 10 for non-seasonal data, and H is equal to 2M for seasonal data, where M is the period of seasonality. And then this, this K here is just basically the lag, so we'll, we'll make it zero here. So uh, I'm assuming uh, non-seasonal data here, and I'm going to run uh, this test. And sure enough, I get a p-value of 0.385. I'm going to assume that I made my hypothesis before I ran that to be 0 0.05, my uh, type 1 error level of significance. And then I'm going to do the same thing for this other test, which is a box young test um, for, for this. And uh, let me run that. Um, and it's 0.35 here. So um, there, those are the, the results with, with the p-values themselves. So just to reiterate, while we're doing these, these two tests of significance, you know, we can create the, the autocorrelation function of the residuals here. Um, however, each one of these is a correlation coefficient, right? These two are positive, just barely above zero, et cetera. So we're actually, when we kind of look at this, we're doing um, multiple, multiple hypothesis tests or simultaneous hypothesis tests at one time, and we're not correcting with the Monferroni or you know, any sort of multiple inference um, thing here. So when we compute this, uh, box Pierce test or this box Young test, we are um, taking that into account. Again, the null hypothesis 
here is that um, there are um, no significant autocorrelations across the horizon, and we're doing uh, 10 here. And then the alternative would be that there are. So with the p-value of 0.385 and a significance level of 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and assume that the um, there are no no significant um, autocorrelations in this series. All right. So just to wrap up, um, we we've, we've covered the R statistics in here. We're looking at these four assumptions that we want within our um, residuals. And next time we'll be talking. Oops. Next time we'll be talking about um, prediction intervals, uh, expanding upon the series. If you have any comments or questions, please send me a note. Thank you very much.